Well, th thanks very much. And I mean, your last few slides, Miranda, reminded me a bit of why I thought I was going to become a marine biologist, because I wanted to look at dolphins and turtles and really cute little blennies. And little did I know at that time that what I was actually going to end up doing was counting through lots of other people's rubbish and <laughs> looking at litter. And over coffee earlier on, I was talking to the Environment Agency, and, and, and I had this really nice offer to have some material that was being screened from sewage plants so that I could have a look at that. Um, however, it's kind of my job, really, in a way, to collect the objective evidence, the hard facts, and, and as you said, Natalie, to then try and take those to, to governments as well as to the media and try and present them in their kind of stark, open light in a neutral way and try to try, although I actually find it quite hard, not to get too passionate about it, to remain objective and factual. And I want to talk to you a little bit about marine litter. I think many of the things I'm going to say, you've actually heard them already today, but if I can give some reinforcement, that would be great. I want to also point towards the areas where I think the solutions lie, and I think you'll have heard some of those today already as well. I mean, it, you know, it is a bit, okay, it's a bit atomberesque, but it is a blue planet when you look at it from a distance. It's actually, you only start to see the litter when you zoom in a little bit closer. And what we find is now whatever ocean system you go to, the surface of the ocean is strewn with items of marine debris. And in many places, that debris is more abundant far away from land, far away from the potential sources, right out in the middle of oceanic gyres. It's also very abundant in the deep sea, um, right down to thousands of metres below the sea surface. And indeed, in some places, we're finding more litter on the deep sea than we are at the surface of the ocean in some of the places you hear about, like the Pacific Garbage Patch. And that's quite surprising when you consider a lot of the litter's plastic and it's positively buoyant when it enters mm -hmm. the ocean. It's still being carried down thousands of metres beneath the surface. I guess where you're most familiar with it is on the strand line washed up at the top of the shore, where you might encounter it during beach cleans or just during a holiday. And that's what kind of brings it, I think, a lot into the public's attention, that it's now difficult to walk more than a few metres on a beach without finding marine litter. If you want to look at it by material type, it soon becomes apparent that it's mostly plastic. Now, the quantities, the relative quantities, vary from beach to beach, from shoreline to shoreline, but typically about 75% <coughs> of everything we pick up on the shore is plastic, with metal and glass as being relatively less abundant. And I think that that gives us some hint of where we need to focus when we start to think about the solutions. I think it makes it justifiable to think about a focus on plastic, because that is the majority of the litter that we're finding. Now, plastic litter, to look at that, of course, it's not all the same. It's not just one item. It ranges from quite unusual large items of, of mega debris. This is the tail cone of a European Space Agency rocket, and you don't find many of those in a 20-year career, but I found this one, down to what actually is now the most abundant type of plastic that we find on many shorelines locally, which is actually the microplastic. Um, there's, these are pieces from the River Tamar, and it was actually in voluntary beach cleans with Marine Conservation Society that first got me looking at microplastic. It was a paper in 2004 that we published that first gave this stuff its name. And where that came from was I realised that in a lot of the beach cleans, I and a lot of the volunteers were going for the large items. We were going for kind of trophy items. What's the biggest tyre, the longest fishing net we can drag up physically to the top of the beach? And while we were doing that, we were walking over what looked like hundreds of thousands of small pieces of plastic. So when I started lecturing to students, I set some of them a challenge and said, Let's go out there and see what the smallest piece of plastic is you can find on the beach. And we came back with some cupfuls of sand and we started to look at them under the microscope. And from the first samples we looked at, we found pieces that sure as hell didn't look like sand. It then took me some years of forensic work to convince everybody that we were finding pieces of plastic less than the diameter of a human hair, smaller than the grains of sand themselves in many of our beaches. So... What does this all result in? Of course, we don't want to hear about it, we don't want to see it, but people want objective evidence. And so you look at economic consequences, and you can look at that just from the cleanup costs. We spend millions of pounds every year in every country throughout the coastal regions of Europe cleaning up our beaches. In the US West Coast alone, we're talking about half a billion US dollars to clean up the shoreline. That's a massive economic cost that could better be spent 
on other things. So if you want to put pounds and dollars on it, we've got ways of doing that just from looking at what we invest in cleanup. But of course, that will miss a lot. It will miss the hazards to mariners. It will miss the unnecessary call-outs for the Coast Guard and the Lifeboat Agency. It will miss all of these encounters to wildlife that we documented um, for um, the IUCN and later the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now over 300 scientific papers documenting encounters between litter and wildlife for 700 odd species. 17% of those are already considered threatened. That's not to say they're just threatened by the litter. They're already threatened in terms of their conservation status and they're having additional encounters with litter. And incidentally, if you break this down by material type, most of those reports, that the, the brown bar on this side, 76% of all the reports by species are reports of encounters between species and plastic. If you look at that by individual, 92% of all the reports of encounters between wildlife and marine litter are with plastic. And I'm just saying that to reinforce that, and I'll come to it later on, I'm not anti-plastic. Plastic brings many societal benefits. But in this context of marine litter, I think it is appropriate to consider a focus on plastic. We now know that microplastics contaminate uh, numerous species of marine life, including commercially important species of fish and shellfish. We looked at uh, species taken from the English Channel, 500 individuals, 10 species. We found microplastic in a third of all the individuals we looked at, and in all 10 species. Now, the quantities were quite low. This isn't a cause for concern to stop us wanting to have the wonderful seafood paella that we had at lunchtime. We're talking about minuscule quantities at the moment, but don't forget that Plastic contamination is a conservative, it's a persistent pollutant. So unless we do something about it, and we come back and we have a meal in 20, 30, 40 years time, maybe the quantities in that sea seafood would be a cause for concern. I don't consider we're there at the moment, but that's not a reason not to want to try and not to want to consider reducing the inputs. If we look at the distribution of, and this is just for microplastic, we see that it's spread far and wide. This is in intertidal <coughs> sediments. This is data from the deep sea with microscopic particles down to three kilometers beneath the, the ocean surface. And this is modeling data indicating the likely distribution. And you see some of the hot spots are far away from the nearest landfall. But, you know, why do I say that? Because the source of all of this stuff really ultimately is on the land. It may have gone into the sea via a boat. It may have been carried in via a river. But it's come from the land and that's where it needs to go back to. It doesn't want to end up in the sea. And it's very clear that unless we do something about it, the situation's only going to get worse. Some of the estimates suggest that we're going to be three times worse than we are today by 2025. Now, there's speculation in that, but they're the best modelling estimates we've got, that by 2025, there could be three times as much litter in the sea as there is today, or actually last year, 2015, um, unless we do something about it. So, OK, you've heard about all of the bad stuff. And I think, you know, if I asked you to put your hands up, all of you would say you want to see less litter in the sea. This, to me, in terms of the cause for concern, is a very clear issue. I don't get marine litter deniers. You do hear of some climate change deniers. I don't see marine litter deniers. We're all kind of united in that. And, that, and why am I making that point? Because it makes it really clear to me that what we need to do is to do something about it. I'm a scientist, and some of my funding comes from chasing the evidence about the harm. But actually, if you're all agreed that this is more harmful than you would want to see then maybe what we need to do is to focus on some of the solutions. So I'm going to turn to those for a moment. Oops, going the wrong way. First point there is that this problem of marine litter is very different to many of the other societal environmental challenges that we face at the moment, in that there's no link here between the thing that us humans want and the damage to the environment. There's no direct link. If you think about fishing and overfishing, and of course we can try and fish sustainably, but every fish we take out of the ocean means there's one less at the time we've taken it out. And unless we fish sustainably, there's going to be a lot less. So there's a link between the thing we want and the potential harm to the environment. It's the same if we all want to spend a holiday by the coast or, or build properties or ports and harbours on the coast. That will directly take away natural habitat for wildlife. The thing we want is directly impacting on the environment. Plastics are not the enemy in this. If we think about plastics, they actually bring many societal benefits, whether that's lightweight parts in actually the hire car that I came here in today, the protective gear for this fisherman, even the nets that do end up as litter, or the packaging that helps to extend the shelf life of food and drink in supermarkets and actually helps to reduce 
a lot of waste and helps to reduce the carbon footprint because many of these plastic packaging items are lighter than the alternatives that we traditionally used to have. But you think about all of those benefits and none of them are linked to an emission. It's different to me turning on the light switch, switch and considering the associated carbon emission or taking an aeroplane journey and thinking about the associated carbon emission. It should be possible to have these benefits from plastic, which I firmly believe have the potential to reduce our footprint on the planet, but to have them without the emission. So it's not about doing without plastics, it's about doing with plastics differently. If we look at what we do do with plastics, we soon see that about 40% of all the production, that's the green line spots at the top, and it's broken down by different polymers, but don't worry about the detail too much, 300 million tonnes of plastic produced every year Properties of plastic, lightweight, inexpensive, durable, so it's going to persist. What do we do with 40% of everything we do make out of plastic? We turn it into single-use items that are used rapidly within a year or so of production and then discarded. So it's hardly surprising that we've got a massive waste management process, a massive, massive waste management problem associated with our current use of plastic. What we would call the throwaway society that we've come to be used to. This is the centre pages of Time Life magazine from the 1950s, extolling the virtues for the family, for the housewife, of being able to throw away all of this stuff in single-use applications. But what we're realising today, of course, is there is no way. This is not sustainable. We're using 8% of world oil production to make plastics, and 40% of what we make, we're throwing away very quickly. And it's a, it's a consequence, in my view, of that wastefulness that we're seeing an accumulation of litter in the sea. That is a symptom of something much bigger that lies behind it, our wasteful use of non-renewable resource, in this case, oil and gas. And if we look at the litter on beaches, and you're absolutely right, we do find rope and netting and we find monofilament, if you look at, but if you totter up and you look at some of the major contributors, you'll find that about 50% of what we pick up is single-use items. Of course, it varies from place to place, but if you look at global data sets and tot it up, you find a lot of it is single-use items. So the same single-use items that I was talking about a moment ago, the bottles and the packaging items, together, of course, with rope and netting and cigarette butts and a whole host of other things. So what do we do to try and solve this problem? You know, the natural tendency when we've made a mess is to want to clean up. And, and please, don't think I'm against clean-up. I'm not against beach cleans. I participate in them. But... Do we want to be cleaning up our planet forever or do we want to stop it going into the ocean in the first place? In my view, the only long-term answer is to stop it going in. And that is where we have to focus. Much of our effort is making sure that we reduce the quantities entering the ocean. We can try and block the holes and the points of entry, but the danger is the flow will just go somewhere else. Really what we've got to do is we've got to redirect this flow of litter that's escaping to the oceans. And actually, when you take it back further, and I've already mentioned 8% of world oil production going in this linear use, and then you suddenly think, hang on a minute, are plastics recyclable? And yes, they are recyclable. Most of them, highly recyclable. So rather than using 8% of world oil production through most of it going in a linear use that's rapidly disposed of, either to landfill or to the natural environment as litter, wouldn't it be far better to capture this stuff and to take it back to the beginning? That would reduce our use of non-renewable resource and it would produce less waste. And it's some of that waste that escapes to the environment. And so, to me, there's a lot of synergies here in solving the problem for the sea with solving the problem in terms of landfill and solving the problem in terms of incineration. And that is costly to local authorities. So if we can reduce the amount of waste we produce, it's going to have a twofold benefit. Actually, threefold, because it's also going to reduce the amount of oil. But then you come to look at the detail, and we talked about plastic bottles earlier on. These bottles are all made of the same polymer, our most recyclable polymer, PET. They've all got the same little triangle on the bottom that tells you that. And yet if I talk to a recycler, they only want one of those bottles. They want the clear one that sits just here. Why? Because the presence of the colouring in the other two makes it unviable for them to recycle it. It reduces the value in the recycling stream by up to 80%. So the economics of recycling are taken away. Why have they been taken away? Well, I'd argue it's nothing to do with getting the goods safely to the consumer. The, the drinks in these bottles would come to you in just as safely, whether they were in clear, blue, green, orange, whatever. The pigment is about marketing. It's about selling the product. 
And I have nothing against marketing in itself, of course. Manufacturers need to sell things. But if the presence of that pigment is compromising our ability to recycle the most recyclable polymer that we have, the lowest hanging fruit that we have, then there's something that's fundamentally wrong there and we ought to be thinking about a redesign. So part of this solution is about recycling, but what we need to do is to think about the end of life at the beginning of life. When we're designing products, and this is a call to industry, we need to think about what's the fate, what's the environmental fate of this product when you, the consumers, have finished using with it. How do we dispose of it? And I'd argue if industry had perhaps thought a little bit more about microbeads in cosmetics when they were first added and realised that it's not rocket science to imagine that those small particles are going to pass through sewage treatment and into the environment, we maybe wouldn't have designed them in in the first place. So my plea is to think about end of life at the beginning of life. And here, even with potentially our most recyclable polymer, we're not doing that. There are some potentially conflicting drivers here that I just want to touch on for a moment. Um, and this is one where you'd imagine it might reduce, um, in terms of a carbon footprint, using plants rather than non-renewable oil and glass. Uh, sorry, not rather than non-renewable oil and gas to make your plastics. You could grow the carbon um, in fields and turn that into a carbon source for your bottles. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's now a sustainable source of carbon, but it does nothing to stop the linear use of resource. It does nothing to reduce the quantities of litter in the ocean or the quantity of waste in landfill. And it, and it has nothing to do with degradability. The bio in the bioplastic is about the carbon source. It's nothing to do with its degradability. We could, of course, consider trying to design plastics to be biodegradable. And you think, hey, wouldn't that be a, a fantastic solution? The minute they enter the sea as litter, they just disappear. But actually, how is it that we can design a piece of plastic to do its job, to carry those foods and drinks in a range of different climates, in the wind, in the rain, in the hot sun, whether it's a carrier bag or a fizzy drink bottle or a crisp packet, just to give you examples from food packaging, to do that job and protect those, those goods, which is actually reducing wastefulness, and yet the minute it enters the environment as litter, and don't forget, the environment isn't one thing, it's many things. It's the deep sea, where it's cold and it's dark. It's the hot sunny beach out there. It's the Arctic. It's the tropics. It's fresh water. It's seawater. So to be able to design a piece of plastic packaging that could last in service, and yet the moment it entered any natural environment, it somehow now magically knows it's time to self-destruct, is a bit of a myth. We can increase the rate at which things de degrade, but I'd argue we can never increase it fast enough to actually solve the problem of marine litter if we still want to keep the benefits of plastics, which are actually their durability, at the same time. The two things are almost impossible. And the final nail here, really, in the coffin for biodegradables as any centre stage solution, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying there is no place for them, but they're not centre stage, is that the last thing a recycler wants to see in the recycling that's going into their factory is even the smallest quantity of a biodegradable plastic because it will completely compromise the feedstock that they're producing because it's giving it a self-destruct element to it. So to me, that's no, not, certainly not a mainstream answer. Some things, of course, you know, you can't recycle and um, it's, it's not about biodegradable. It's just about doing without them in the first place. You know, it wasn't clear to me why we needed to cleanse ourselves in millions of small pieces of plastic and with some of our research at Plymouth that showed that a single container could, could, could have a, a approaching three million particles in it, a hundred thousand particles every time you washed with some of these products. Why did we need to do that in the first place? And it's about thinking about end of life then at the beginning of life and thinking what's the fate of, of the products that we make. And then I think we need to link that to the consumer who goes out and votes with their feet in the supermarkets and we need clear labelling to inform consumers about the environmental footprint of some of the packaging. You're fairly used to seeing, you know, how much sugar, how much fat, how much carbohydrate is in this piece of chocolate or this bottle of fizzy pop. What about something to indicate the environmental footprint of the packaging? And okay, you know, you've come here to this conference to hear more about some of these environmental topics. You might react to that. Would 95% of the population? No. They probably wouldn't. But what it would do, I believe, is it would actually tip manufacturers and brand owners into thinking, hang on a minute, if I could package my goods in a way that would bring a green dot onto them rather than a red dot, and I could do that for more or less the same cost, actually, perhaps I ought to start doing it, even if I've only lost 5% of my customers 
through not doing so. And so it's a way of growing momentum to the idea of moving towards a more circular economy. We're coming, we are coming to the end. The final thing, and don't try and take all, all of this in, but there's a point here to be made that, you know, the solutions that I've talked about, there's no single silver bullet there. There's no single solution. It's not about paper or plastic. It's not about degradables or not. There's a role for degradables, but it's not center stage. And it's even more complicated than that because the solutions that might apply here in a fairly developed nation in the UK, in Europe, in the US is different to the kind of solution that might apply in a developing nation. And so we need to be prepared to think about the answers in terms of the place where, that, where, where the litter is being generated, where the products are being used. So we not only need to think about end of life at the beginning of life, we need to think about where that end of life will be. Is it a product that's finishing its lifetime here? Or is it a product that's finishing its lifetime somewhere in Central Africa or South America? And why have I put this slide up? Because these are estimates of the 20 worst countries contributing plastic litter to the oceans. Now, they're estimates. There's going to be noise in that. But the point here is that two nations that are in there, one, uh, one, one here, the US, and the other one, China, I'm going to pick on for examples, because they're in that table for different reasons. China is in there because its waste management system is not especially developed. So there's high wastage, leakage to the environment, potentially generating substantial quantities of marine litter. But if you look at the column relating to litter per person, sorry, not litter, waste per person, the Chinese don't produce very much litter. They're actually not very wasteful. But they're in this league table because their waste management system isn't so good. The US is there. It has a great waste management system, but its citizens produce a lot of waste. So there are different reasons that you might have a country contributing to substantial quantities of waste. And incidentally, don't think we get off the hook. We're only off the hook because the analysis was done by country. If, if we had something, you know, if you looked at it across the European Union, if you still believe in anything like that, then we probably feature there too. But the UK is a little bit too small to feature on its own. But the point here is it's no good thinking there's one single fix-it solution. It varies according to the application. It's about thinking about end of life at the beginning of life and also thinking about where will that end of life occur. Okay, so just to wrap up, marine litter, in my view, is an, it's a symptom of a problem. It's a symptom of an inefficient and outdated business model, this linear use of resource. It's not directly coupled to societal benefits. It's clear to me that plastics bring many benefits, but those benefits could be realised without the need for the litter. So it's not about us all doing without something, turning off the lights or not taking an aeroplane journey. It's about us doing it differently. It's very clear that there's harm, whether that's to the economy, to wildlife, to various ecosystem services. It's also clear that there are synergistic benefits from doing something about it. It will, it will help to reduce use of non-renewable oil and gas. It will help to reduce waste going to landfill or to incineration. And at the same time, the leakage that we're worried about that's going to the sea, to the environment. There are solutions, but we have to recognise that there isn't a wand. There's no single solution. It's about thinking about end of life at the beginning of life and where that end of life will happen. The final thing I'd say is, and I think this just gives us some leverage, is that it's a highly emotive, visible problem. It's something that many people, most people, want to see less of and are concerned about. And it's a problem that attracts high-profile people to want to give input to it. And I think that that should help to push the boulder to get it rolling down the hill. The thing that sits in the solutions that I've hinted at all the way along are things like product design and waste management. I bet we wouldn't be all here listening to a talk about product design and waste management. And, and you know, the same themes would not attract world leaders or, you know, TV personalities. The issue of marine litter is the emotive thing. So what we've got to try and do is take that passion for the sea and focus it back at the stuff that's more dull, which is the waste management and the product design. And any suggestions for how to do that, I would really love to hear. Um, if you want to, oops, that's the wrong button. If you want to find out more about the work that we do, you can Google the International Marine Litter Research Unit and you'll find some of the papers there. If you want me to send you anything, very happily do so. Thank you very much.